Welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed show with your spicy hosts, Tara and Sylvie. We show up every episode to expose, uncover, and share what we know about SEX. This isn't what you'll find in your typical sex ed class. Juicy sex talk is under-discussed, and we're doing what we can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from cultural norms and design the sex life they crave. And hey, if you are looking for more after the show, we invite you to get social. Our Instagram is the.sexed.show, and we would love for you to give us a follow. And we have our first cis male interview on our show, James... Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if we should be cheering for cis males. <laughs> right. I feel like they get quite a lot of cheering as it is, but we can cheer for James because he is Tara's partner. And today we invited him to join our show to share his experience of dropping traditional and patriarchal mindsets, which is a big deal. Mm-hmm. We talk about how these mindsets have negatively impacted him and the tools he's used to help ditch them and what shifts he's noticed after, um, and especially when it came to his personal relationships, sex, and intimacy. This isn't, of course, James's first time on the mic. He has actually recorded over 100 episodes with Tara on their former podcast, Sex Uninterrupted, and he has traveled to events like Young Swingers Week and Naughty in New Orleans to speak at workshops and panels and share his knowledge and experience with other men. And before we drop into our somatic inquiry, James and I just want to acknowledge the land on which we sit. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, play, and are recording this episode on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy and Treaty Region 7 of Southern Alberta. So today's somatic inquiry is actually from a book called Science for Sexual Happiness, A Guide to Reclaiming Erotic Pleasure by Kath and Jesse. And this is a text that is part of our curriculum in the Institute for the Study of Somatic Sex Education. So if you're wanting to do this somatic inquiry with us, take some time to get yourself comfortable and listen up. And if not, then you can also fast forward through this. So totally up to you. So one thing I like to invite people to do before starting is just to get a little bit comfortable, maybe 10% more comfortable than what you are right now. And you're welcome to close your eyes, soften your gaze, or keep your eyes open, whatever works for you. I'm just inviting you to sit with your hands on your lower belly and your feet planted solidly on the ground. This is a posture in which both feet are on the ground and your spine is straight, but not rigidly so. Uncrossed legs allow the flow of energy to pass freely through your body. Your hands could be resting lightly on your thighs or the arms of the chair or even clasped together in your lap. Notice the position of your head and neck. Notice your sits bones in the chair. Perhaps you can even feel your genitals touching the chair. Take a moment to notice your feet resting on the floor. And maybe feeling some roots extending from the soles of your feet into the ground. Through the floor, the soil layers the rock layers, crystal layers, deep into the center of earth. Noticing temperature, maybe you feel heat. I'm just inviting you to bring that energy from the center of the earth back up through all the layers of this beautiful planet into your feet, your ankles, your calves, thighs, pelvis. Feel the heat in your lower belly. 
Allow it to swirl in your pelvic bowl. Imagine it warming your genitals. Perhaps it feels pleasurable to rock on your sits bones. Bring one hand down to hold your genitals and the other to your heart. Take a gentle breath to your body. Come to stillness and breathe into your hands. And that concludes the somatic inquiry. James, seeing as you're the guest, how was that for you? Because I watched you do it. Because we're sitting in the same room. <laughs> it was good. I felt uh, I felt I feel more grounded now. Obviously, uh, came into this with a little bit of half in my step. Obviously, I kind of had to rush home from my regular job to be here. So it's been one of those kind of hectic days and that was a good little grounding moment for me a manic monday it definitely <laughs> was just another manic monday <laughs> what about you sylvie how did you feel that that was a much needed pause in an otherwise hectic day so thank you for that tara i always forget that those somatic exercises which seem so very basic are so transformational yeah even reading them or like offering them, I always feel a sense of groundedness and calmness after, even if I'm the one like doing it. It's nice. Yeah. It's like co-regulation almost. Yeah. Although sometimes I get a little bit of imposter syndrome when I'm doing these somatic inquiries where I think, is this person going to sit up right now and be like, wow, this is bullshit. <laughs> like, what are you doing? This is lame. And I always have like this little voice in me that's like some, someone is going to do that. And then I'm like, no, no one's going to do that. Everyone likes to relax. But I, yeah, I haven't had any years there. Have you ever had anybody say that to you? I've had experiences with body poem. Okay. Most people, 95% of people love body poem. And I've had experiences where a few people have been like, I'm not feeling anything. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. And then it's like, oh, man. But really, okay. that's not really for them then. Well, it's right. not a fail. That's feedback. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, as a trained hypnotherapist, I know that some people just will not go under in hypnosis either. It's, you know, and it's an inability to switch off the chattering part of the mind. And you know, meditation probably doesn't work super well for them. Hypnosis probably doesn't work super well. And probably somatic inquiries don't work super well. And that's because there's some sort of a discomfort in being in the body. There is something there that is making it so uncomfortable that even just taking those two minutes of grounding can feel profoundly uncomfortable, especially if there's trauma in people's bodies. So that is always a good thing to remember. Hmm. And letting go of the... Uh, expected outcome which is still always very hard for me mm -hmm. and even when like you're in a hectic monday like we're in right now or a manic monday as tara put it it does bring you back down to a level because we get so used to being at such a high frantic level all the time we just get so used to it and it becomes like a normal and when you become out of that normal you're like oh this is this real life <laughs> can feel like this <laughs> yeah it's true so i like it but we get so used to being in that frantic state all the time that it becomes normal and you're just like why yeah no it's true i actually was always like thriving and not thriving opposite of thriving in that state and i had a psychologist like suggest like using a timer so every two hours this timer would go off and that was like a reminder to just do like this little body scan and check in and that really helped to bring more mindfulness and less like chaoticness to my life. It's funny because I just got an Apple Watch. I resisted the trend for a very long time. And I finally bought myself one this year. And it goes off every hour to remind you to stand up and do something for one minute. And Ohad always laughs at me because every hour, like some sort of a manic creature I stand up and start doing jumping jacks and it looks seemingly out of the blue because 
he can't necessarily hear or feel the vibration <laughs> on my wrist because it's switched yeah. down pretty low. So it just looks like I've randomly just gotten up and started doing weird manic motions out of nowhere. And he's like, is that your watch telling you to do a thing again? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> and he's like, you look like an idiot. <laughs> I'm like, I know. But I had to stand up. And he's like, you don't have to stand up and do weird things. He's like, just stand up. <laughs> But yeah, it's a, it's a nice little one minute dance break every hour. Right. Yeah. Like, hey, I'm human. Get up and do something human-y. Yeah. Move <laughs> the body. You have a body. As our colleague Lachlan would say, be a buddy to your body. Be a buddy to your body? Yeah. That was James, what's Lachlan. your favorite thing to do to get back into your body? Probably masturbate. Okay. Yeah. Good Every one. hour? So that'd be too- <laughs> <laughs> I'd be quite dehydrated by the end of it, but... We're not teenagers anymore. That definitely did used to happen quite frequently for me as a teenager. I remember thinking, wow, am I actually going to be a productive adult with the amount of time I need to masturbate every day? Like it was, you know, five, six times at one point. And then I stopped being a teenager and it was like, oh. I hormones can't. wore off yeah <laughs> hormones a little change. bit yeah. they kind of crash <laughs> yeah mm. but yeah so james is there anything important that i missed from my intro that you would like to share not really i have done as a as sylvie said i've done some uh, workshops with uh, strictly only men and they were it's interesting when you get a bunch of men together uh, i come from a background of non-monogamous relationships. And like Sophie said, we've gone to events at Young Swingers Week and Hedonism and uh, Nadia Nolens. And those events turn to mostly like non-traditional relationships, such as non-monogamy, ethical non-monogamy, swingers, that sort of lifestyle of people. And it is so interesting when you get a group of guys, like let's say the people from like my hometown and you get those people together versus like these people, which you would think that would become more, I'm not going to say evolved, but they like have tried different ways of, you know, interacting and having relationships. And some of the same concerns are across both sides. So that's why I Mm -hmm. like this sort of talk and talking about like the patriarchy and, talking about how like tradition non-traditional ways of thinking can kind of take you outside the box but it still brings you back home to kind of how you were raised like nobody's really raised like a swinger or nobody's really raised to be gay or nobody's really raised to be bisexual or in any way shape or form but it's funny when you start to talk to these people and you get down to like you know the deeper levels we all roughly have the same sort of issues And so it's quite interesting. So my background comes from non-traditional relationships and just talking with people. Uh, Like you said, Sylvie, we've done over a hundred episodes of our podcast and we talk to so many different people and from all different types of backgrounds. And it was just, it was a learning experience for two two years almost. Mm -hmm. And it just brought us to a level that like we were understanding so many different types of lifestyles and so many different types of things that it just, it also enhanced our relationship because we were talking so much and it was just great. So that's my background, I guess. (laughs) In a nutshell. (laughs) And yeah, like, like James said, we wanted to talk about dropping those traditional mindsets. And so when we're talking about that, mainly what we're referring to is like the patriarchy and the society we're all pretty much raised in and like James like what's your take on the patriarchy like what do you have to say about it because maybe some people listening have one idea of what it is and so maybe you want to share that with listeners I think the patriarchy kind of stems to a point of male dominancy and not necessarily just male dominancy but like tailored towards men specifically Mm -hmm. and mostly cis men because we end up on that end of the spectrum where it gets tailored towards that sort of, I guess, human being as a whole. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I don't necessarily, I've 
of course, I'm the editor of this podcast as well. So I've heard numerous times Sylvie and Tara talking about the patriarchy and trying to break traditional norms. And we've talked, me and Tara have talked about that extensively on our podcast as well, because we were breaking outside of the traditional relationship type and talking about it with so many different people. I think that, you know, and we'll get into this later on, but I think that that tailored towards men and like we see it in society when it comes to business, we see it when it comes to relationships, we see it when we're raising men specifically, you know, it's almost like the world is, you know, your world's your oyster and you can do whatever you want, but you seem to be able to be better if you were a cis man. And it's not right in my opinion, but it's kind of how society has looked at uh, the patriarchy as a whole, I think. Yeah. Does it make you ever uh, defensive or roll your eyes if a woman says something about the patriarchy to you? Because I know that, you know, my husband, who's also, a, he defines himself as a feminist man. When I mention the patriarchy, he still will sometimes roll his eyes or be like, oh, that's what you say about everything. But it's funny. So when we were talking about the show notes for this show, this was my interpretation and Tara had a different take on it and I'll let you hear hers. But I kind of said that speaking it into existence constantly gives it attention. And I think that that kind of keeps that sort of mentality continuously going that if you stop talking about it, it might not continue to be there because you see it more and more nowadays where there's women CEOs and there are women driven businesses and there are numerous things where the matriarchy comes into play more often than it, you know, it's not talked about enough where the patriarchy seems to be talked about more and more. And Tara, you had a little different view. Yeah. I'm more from like the social justice standpoint where I'm like, if you don't talk about the issues and provide education and resources for people to, in quotation marks, do better and learn more and expand their minds, then how is that ever going to change? So I'm like, it's important to talk about it. I hear it a lot. Let's just say that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm curious, James. I read a very interesting post the other day by Clementine Ford, who's a sex educator and feminist, and she gets a lot of hate mail uh, from, from men and uh, and a lot of the men are accusing her of hating them. And uh, she she wrote this reply that says, how does women hating you threaten your life? Are women colluding together to sexually assault you, to film it and share it with their friends? Do women leak your nude photographs to communities of other women to jerk off over? How many women are gatekeeping government positions orchestrating to keep men out? How many women make jokes about beating men, raping men, killing men, met by rooms full of laughter from other women who secretly fantasize about doing these things? How much mainstream pornography involves women anally raping men, spitting on them, calling them whores and sluts? How many men in their daily lives fear that dates with women will end in rape or coercion, that women will remove the condom as a joke during sex to brag about to their friends? will uh, we'll accidentally slip a strap on into their ass without lube, will tell men, I can't come unless I'm fucking you in the ass, will shame men for not letting them do whatever they want to them sexually, no matter how much it hurts, will surround men on the streets and leer at them. Show us your dick, love. Calm down, love. It's just a joke, you fucking ugly dog. Women do not do these things. Women are not culturally supported to do these things. Women have no structural power over men and none of the irritation or even outright anger you're subjected to as a result of women's fury at your behavior has any power to actually harm or threaten you. I thought that was quite powerful. Very powerful. What what do you feel when you hear that, James? I feel like kicking the nuts. (laughs) (laughs) But it's too true. That's the sad part. Yeah. That's very sad. When you hear it, You're like, eh, and you started going on and then you didn't stop. Like you think you'd stop after like the third or fourth point, but it just kept going and kept going. And it, 
when you start to break it down and you actually think about like your past and you think about those conversations that you've had and those things that you've talked about and the things that have been shared and like, and I've been in a locker room, I used to play football. So it's not necessarily those conversations do exist and it's sad. It's very sad. What would you say was the moment that you sort of got enlightened to the fact that you as a man are a member of the patriarchy and that it's your job to deconstruct it for yourself and for others. When would you say that moment sort of hit you? When I met this one and I'm pointing at Tara. <laughs> changed... What? What did I do? <laughs> well, no, it changed everything. I used to be like a very sort of, I wouldn't say possessive, but I was definitely a jealous individual. I didn't necessarily like my significant other talking to other people in that sense and i couldn't i kept getting into these relationships and they kept failing and failing and failing and i couldn't understand maybe it was me you know what i mean like am i the drama so i couldn't understand i wanted to change the way i perceived specifically relationships and how i got into relationships and if you ever go back to one of our sex interrupted shows on the early ones, we talk about how we met and the whole journey that we went on. So go to episode, I don't know, I have four no maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but when we started out as friends with benefits, we had this sort of weird, like we're not, weren't afraid to lose each other. And it wasn't that we were like afraid to lose each other, but we were friends first. And then we had these benefits and it turned into Obviously, the relationship that you see today, which is, you know, 10 years, we've been engaged for two years and three, and three. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> All I know is I. But what was proposed... the point that you were like, wow, there actually is some issues in society? Uh, well, or was it just gradual, like me always kind of bringing up stuff? Well, or... we would party with like some of my old like hometown friends and that became a real eye opener when we were opening up our relationship into where we were and the things that we were doing now i would never recommend this but it, it is a way to start in open relationships is playing with your friends but that playing with your friends aspect turned into people always trying like to get back into what we had and then would always ask like a lot of the guys like my friends would ask me how do you let her do that how do you and it started to click for me more and more that like wait how do i let her she's a human being i don't let her do anything she's you know i respect her and her decisions and whatever decisions she decides to make i hope that she would ha want to communicate that with me and you know, develop that sort of idea so that we can both be comfortable with it. So it's not just like, I'm going to do this. I don't give a shit about your feelings. Whereas it started to become, because we were friends, we didn't really have that at first. And then when we started getting into a relationship, it started to grow and grow and grow. But then it was like the conversations I would have elsewhere with other cis men that were in these relationships that they were, you know, constantly like, oh, I'm having all these troubles in my relationship and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, maybe if you didn't cheat on them or <laughs> maybe if you didn't, you know, there's so many ideas that like I was starting to have within just having conversations with my significant other and opening the dialogue up that started to change the way I perceived the way relationships should be and the way that, no, I don't want to say should be, but could be. Let's just say that. And it started to develop and more and more. There wasn't like a specific point. It was just over gradual over time that the conversations we were having, the honesty that was coming out of both of us became this beautiful relationship that you, that, like I said, you see today and it became more and more this understanding. And, and then throughout the podcast and talking with other people and even talking with our friends in the lifestyle and, it just, it started to realize like, oh my gosh, we do roughly have similar problems, but how we learn to, I don't want to say deal with, but maybe like cope and start navigate. to like navigate. There are so many different avenues than just which a typical men would do would probably just shut down, put up walls, 
stop talking, stop sharing, stop get angry. A hundred percent, right? And it would start to just become almost frustrating when you're like, there are tools out there that you can use that we use almost every day that just kind of made things just better for both of us, at least yeah. for me. And I'd like to add that I'm very consent focused. And even before doing the school of consent, that was a big thing in the lifestyle and in non-monogamy for us. And that was one thing we often spoke about at workshops and stuff. So we, we did a lot of work in understanding consent to a certain degree and you know through that a lot of that is deconstructing the pa patriarchy and entitlement that people think they have towards others bodies 100 percent, the entitlement yeah like i'm a man so i can touch you and what are you gonna do about it yeah complain you're at a, a sex party like you mm -hmm. should just you should expect to be touched that way well, and right. that's and what people many, think. And how many times in like rape cases and sexual assault cases that the question of what you were wearing or what were you doing, like how much what you drank, the fuck does it matter? Were you under the influence? Yeah. And it's, that's very sad that we haven't educated people uh, as much as we probably should have on consent, boundaries, you know, rules, things that should not be crossed having conversations to see if this is okay or not. And so many people aren't willing to put in the work. And I know men specifically, because if you put in the work, then you could be perceived as weak or a pussy or whatever. But it's all because you're so worried about the outside projection or the outside view of what who you are as a human being. And a lot of times it just comes in conflict with growth. Yeah. Now we've talked about how patriarchy negatively impacts women, but how does it negatively impact men, James, and also their relationships? Well, effective communication, not being taught effective communication tools. Like, you know, the, I didn't develop those until I was with Tara. I didn't have those, you know, wants, needs, desires talks with my partners. I never had any of that stuff. And I also probably was a big infringement on consent. You know, I would, you know, walk by my significant other, maybe smack her on the ass or grab her boobs or, you know, whatever. And I never really thought about even asking that question. And for me, that was just a huge eye opener. Um, finding ways of communicating. I, you don't have those tools. I wasn't given those tools. And as soon as I started talking about my feelings with my friends, well, now we're back at you're a pussy or you're too in touch with your emotions. I can't deal with you or whatever mm -hmm. it happened to be. I think that uh, there's also like, I like to think of the patriarchy and I wanted to say this earlier, but it's like kind of like a box, right? And you want to fit every, that sort of stuff into that box and that's kind of like how you should think, how you should act, how you should feel and how you should communicate. Right. And it never, it never turned into growth. It was always this like standard practice. It's, this is how it is. It's one way, you know, your parents, they, they went through this and then their parents went through this and it keeps getting passed down from generation to generation of just these things that just don't, maybe don't align with who you are as a human being I mean, who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. And I find that sometimes you again, up get stuck in the box. And like I've, we were talking about this when we were doing the show notes for this was you may probably run from a good relationship because it's not excellent because it doesn't fit inside that box. And I find that that's something that would hinder you that you might just pass up on a relationship because it didn't fit that mold that you've been taught to look for or, to be in exactly mm -hmm. i think sometimes talking about your emotions ident learning to identify your emotions and learning to identify like we were talking about in the somatic inquiry how it makes you feel when you're talking about some things like specifically let's say jealousy mm -hmm. which is a big which is a really big one for i find for a lot of cis men 
it happens to be that jealousy because you're like, well, she's mine. She's mine. And like, she shouldn't be talking to these people. So like it comes into possession. Yeah. And when we don't talk about those feelings, those things just start to eat away at your insides and they'll eat away at your relationship so fast because you just, it's going to build and build and build. And then there's going to be this big explosion. And during that big explosion, we all know that things can get, go way too far. And I find that if you don't talk about your emotions or learn to how to navigate them, it can start to control you. And like I said, abandoning healthy relationships. And a lot of times these, well, specifically me, I wasn't willing to change. Like I, I used to say, I am who I am. You know what I mean? And I would be like, I am who I am. You're not going to change me. And I wasn't, I was so adamant about growth and change and thinking that there was a different way of doing things that might be and just better for me in the long run and would probably make me happier. And I was just so against it. And then I met Tara and it was like, it was constant growth. And there was like, we talked about it when we were in the lifestyle that there was an, always like going to be, in, there's going to be your high points and there's going to be your low points. What you really want to do is kind of just flatten the curve just a little bit. So your high points are still good, but your low points aren't as low as you, you know, you get to that low point. So you kind of flatten it out. So where you kind of staying still in this up and down, there's always going to be an up and down, but it kind of ends up being so much easier when you can just balance out that those highs and lows and use effective communication. So, yeah. And it also, I think one of the big things that the patriarchy does is it does hinder your relationship with other men because there's, uh, we, you know, it's the keeping up with the Joneses, that whole aspect. You see like your buddy and he's got a, what is perceived to be this great relationship and blah, 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 blah. And then you see him on a night out and he's done a bunch of drugs, which his partner's not okay with. And he's making out with other girls and he's going home with this other girl. And you're like, but you got this great relationship. How, how did you get there? And it started for me, like we were talking about with bringing friends in, I would have these guys that would asking me these questions that I just didn't feel like I should be answering, right? Like these are conversations that they should be having with their significant other. And it started to affect those relationships with other men because it was like, I couldn't be their counselor. I couldn't be their uh, therapist. Like I needed, they needed to talk about some of these feelings that were coming up for them, but they didn't know how. And it started to frustrate me because I was like, they would turn to me and I would be like, <laughs> I barely got my shit going on. I'm still learning and trying to grow from this. So yeah, I do feel like sometimes your relationships with other men definitely becomes affected. Yeah. And part of the patriarchy's great lie, of course, is uh, that men are told over and over and over again, that it's their job to protect women. But they're not actually protecting women, they're protecting their property, which they then put women in that class of property. And when you dehumanize women to the value of property, then you can also do horrible things to property, right? Because it's, it's not a real human and who cares? But then it puts all of the responsibility for the protection on the person who's supposed to be in charge of that particular property. And if somebody doesn't have a protector, then they're fair game. And if they do have a protector, then why would you be going sharing her around with other people? Like, you know, that's, so that is, again, another way that the patriarchy dehumanizes and also puts you in a sticky position of having to show up as this protector and owner of property while just trying to be in love, be tender, be with your heart, be with your feelings. Mm-hmm. Wow, what a good way of putting that. I never really even thought about it in that particular way. But now that you said that, I see that all the time. I got another thing that doesn't hinder specifically for the patriarchy. When it comes to sex, you think about it in one way. And that's majority of the time, P and V. Yeah. Mm. You think of it. And I got stuck in that way. Trust me. I, I'm a sexual blueprint. 
I got stuck in that way of thinking, of thinking, well, this is how sex is supposed to be. And it wasn't until I started even exploring my own asshole, like, holy cow. So if you ever want to, you know, get outside of like normal shit and trust me, it's not gay. If you like it up the butt, you can still be a (laughs) hetero flexible man like myself and take it up the butt from whoever. And it feels great. It feels great. Let's just say that. It's very down regulating for the nervous system. Yeah, like the patriarchy can gatekeep pleasure for men. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Just go and experience it. Why not give it a <laughs> shot? You might not like it. You might not like it. That's fine. But what if you do? That's yeah. another level that you get to add to your sexual repertoire to say, hey, peg me in the ass. Let's go. Or a finger. <laughs> yeah, just a finger. Just yeah. one. Just a tiny little pinky. Do you want to start with a pinky? Yeah, sure. (laughs) I think last week we spoke to Dr. Kate Lister, who's a sex historian, and she told us that even the word vagina comes from the Latin word for sheath, like a sheath for a sword. So, you know, just you mentioning that, you know, men have this very small imagination when it comes to like, or just the patriarchy in general, because many women are also indoctrinated in the patriarchy and have this view that sex is simply mm-hmm. penis and vagina, because that is what their vagina is for. It is a sheath for a sword. And if you're not going to put the sword in there, then what is the point of it? And, you know, just having that awareness that you have holes in your body too, and maybe your holes are also pleasurable. And, Maybe it's not just about sticking things in places, but also receiving things, right? And being the person that receives, because I think a lot of times, and we see it as sexological body workers, I'm sure you see it too, Tara, with your clients, that men sometimes have difficulty relaxing into receiving of anything. Yeah, men, everybody usually has difficulty with it, but yeah. Definitely men feel like they should be the the doers, the ones doing the action, typically. And you've received I've, body work from me. Yeah, but I've also <laughs> fall I've also fallen I've fallen into that when we were starting out in the in the lifestyle as a whole that I thought that I had to be I, I, I have some talented fingers, let's just say, and I've made a numerous women a squirt. And that was like sort of this thing that I kept having to feel like I had to do it. And then when I, if I did it with one person, then there would be a lineup of other people that wanted to try to experience it and blah, 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 blah. And I had just found a technique that kind of worked, but it was also like, I don't, it should, like, I, I would fall into that sort of thing of feeling like I always had to be doing, 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 doing instead of like, Hey, why can't I just receive something? Mm-hmm. And it was, I, it took us a while into the relationship for me to explore my anus, my prostate, and it, uh, let's just say it felt good. So yeah, and now I'm open to trying numerous different things. Talk to me about your relationship with hardness, because I know that hardness is something that a lot of men have an interesting relationship with a lot of times. And again, this is a patriarchal thing, but women expect men to be hard, not just hard emotionally but hard physically and they take it very personally or a lot of them do take it very personally if a man can't get hard or loses his hard on in bed tell me about your relationship as a man with being hard and what that means for you i never really had a problem with it so that i knew you were gonna say something I'm like never, this isn't i've okay. never really okay. had a problem with it but i also have no problem with it when we were Let's just say we were playing with other couples and sometimes the men in the, but the group of people, there might be a man or two men that just, it just doesn't is their vibe, but that becomes the whole reality of it is, is that everybody's yum is not everybody's yum. Right. And so sometimes when you get overstimulated and you get like, way too or even drunk or on drugs or whatever it happens to be this might be way too overwhelming for you and a lot of 
And the first thing that ends up happening is that blood flow ends up going somewhere else and not to your penis. And it's not a, and but what, what about if like. it's somebody who has like a physical disability? And because like what we're saying is men don't feel like men. If they don't get hard. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Why? Of course. Tell me why, why you said, of course. Why? Because that's the box. Right. That's the whole ideology behind it. You got to fit in this box and having a flaccid cock is not in that box. And not to say, and like of being a man of for quotation. being a man, because you're supposed to be the hunter. You're going to gather and you're going to fuck. Oh my God. We've do, talked do you, about do you, that. Sylvia. Do you hunt and gather with your penis? Of do course I do. Gather with your penis? Of course. A hundred percent. It's I'm out, funny. Hun I'm hunting with my cock. That's what I'm doing. It's funny because Tara and I have had this discussion and I told Tara that I had a client once who, you know, we were struggling with some erectile dysfunction for him. And he he said those exact words, come on, I'm a man, I'm a hunter gatherer, I can't be soft. And I asked him, do you hunt and gather with your penis? And he said, no, of course not. And I said, what do you hunt and gather with? And he was like, what do you mean? And I was like, do you hunt and gather with your arms? And he was like, well, I guess, yeah. And I was like, what happens if I cut off your arm? Are you still a man? And he was like, of course. I was like, are you less of a man if I cut off your arm? And he was like, no. And I was like, but if your penis gets soft, you're somehow less of a man, even though you're not hunting and gathering with your penis. So what gives? Like, you're not shooting a woolly mammoth with it. What are you doing with it? <laughs> well, have you ever been in like running a race and then just got an erection no i'm not asking you i'm asking no. mostly I the mean, listeners no, sounds kind of fun <laughs> but like honest. that majority of the time that does not happen because the blood flow the focus where you're at what you're doing those are all like set and setting for some people is everything and that is the majority of the time, some ways that they can only get hard is that set and setting is right down their alley and where they receive, where they are comfortable, where they are at their peak in their own, I guess, reality. And that right there is when you get hard. I don't, as I said, I don't necessarily have a problem getting hard. I have had moments though, where I wasn't enjoying what was going on and I have gone flaccid. And to be fair, all I did was just explain my my position. And if somebody didn't want to hear me, then I realized that that person wasn't somebody that I wanted to be involved with. But a lot yeah. of people, if you have this issue, it's it's common for a lot of people. And to be fair, you should try trying to, in my opinion, talking to an SSE like these two <laughs> or talking to a therapist or talking to somebody that can give you some tools and start to realize that there are that set and setting that becomes so important that you need to try to find those moments. And also that it's not the priority. You can have sex with multiple different body parts other than your penis. Let's just say that. Yeah. And a soft cock has its merits, right? Like soft cocks can be pleasurable. Mm-hmm. Well, and I heard you talk about it in, I think it was like episode three or whatever, when you were talking about uh, one of the guys that you worked with, Sylvie, you gave them a strap on so that they at least had that feeling of that. The energetic. Call. The energetic way of just saying like, I, this, I, I can like, I can still be a man by just feeling like this because I have that presence and you have that. And Tara talked about it when she went to the hotel takeover and she walked around with the strap on the whole time and she said she had that feeling and it just kind of feels good. And, but it it's not necessary. It's not necessary in the grand scheme of things that you have to be hard. You have to do these things. You have to, have to, have to, but that's what the patriarchy does. It forces you to fit inside the box. And if you don't fit inside the box, you're fucking weird or you're out or you're not part of it. And you know, you're an outsider or whatever it happens to be. But that idea of getting hard and is the only perception, or I guess the only mark of a true man I just, <laughs> sorry, I just can't buy into it. Yeah. And I guess, you know, the more people who exit the box, the more people who are outside of the box, the less lonely 
it is out there. So the less weird you then are. The box is out there and not inside the little stupid box. The people are outside of the box. Yeah, there. exactly. Yeah. Well, no, but then the box becomes everybody else's perception and it's no longer the patriarchy and it's abandoning all these other things and it becomes this outside world of all these people that don't want to fit into this little box and then like you guys talked about in the last episode was talking about labels that's just like that whole idea that you have to be a bull and you gotta you know take what's yours it's just you don't have to there are other exhausting Sounds right. exhausting to be a man. Exhausting. <sighs> I would say it can be exhausting, but again, there's it's so exhausting many... to be in the society. There's so many different ways <laughs> of also so... looking at it for sure. James, like, what are some ways that you, some men might be listening and they're like, hmm, like this is interesting. Where can I start deconstructing my mindset around these traditional ways of being? Like what what would you say if somebody were to come to you and ask you that question? Can you repeat it again? I'm trying. <laughs> what are some ways men can start like shedding those patriarchal mindsets? Grow, learn. Um, we talked about this uh, when we we're doing the show notes was learning consent is a big one. Mm. And I definitely learned that, especially with specifically with you. And as obviously it's gotten progressively more and more, like even like I would at the end of the day, when we're right before we're going to bed, I would usually just kiss her. That was just my thing. I would say good night and I would kiss her. And now I ask, can I kiss you? Why and not? sometimes I'll tell you where I want to be kissed. And and sometimes I'm like on my forehead, on my lips, on my cheek, like on my vagina. <laughs> But it's pretty rare because yes, I'm please. asleep by then. <laughs> yeah, she's like, I'm going to bed. What are you talking about? <laughs> but that learning consent is another major tool that you can start learning. And again, the whole going back to the first point that I ever made was communication, learning effective communication tools and communication styles. Active listening is a big one. Sitting down and actually listening to your partner and how they like, you know, they want to get their wants, needs, desires out there, what they're looking for, what they want. Honesty is a big thing. Learn to be honest. I'm not saying go out there and be a complete dick and like, you know, have no compassion. But honesty for me, when I was starting with Tara, was something that I I never wanted to lie to her. And that was something like even as friends, like I I, I just didn't lie to her. One, because I wasn't fearful of losing like a partner. I was, I would, you know, I could lose a friend, but she had that great respect for me. And I had respect for her that we wanted to be brutally honest with each other. We wanted to have those open lines of communication. The honesty part just sort of started to become so natural that I didn't feel like I had to lie if I was looking at another girl or if I was talking about somebody that I had a conversation at work. It just sort of, you know, flowed naturally. And it was it was a great tool to learn. I think <laughs> taking time, like I said, the active listening and the effective communication, but taking the time to sit down and talk about these things was something that I find is huge. Setting that time aside, one, to be playful, obviously, but also take the time to sit down and just talk. You know, no, put your phones away, put your the TVs away, computers away, whatever it happens to be, get away from the screens and just mm -hmm. sit down and have a real like heart to heart communication just between two people. And it, the conversation can just flow in whatever direction it happens to go. But if you want to talk about some serious things, this is a great opportunity to be able to express how you're feeling, things that you would like to see or you want to experience. And, and it, and it should be personal. It should never be like an attack on the other person. That's another thing that you mm -hmm. should try to do is never, never project your own shit onto somebody else. And like saying like, well, I didn't like it when you felt, when you did this, it's more, I felt this way when this happened. So there's just, and all like that goes back to effective communication and, you know, just actually taking the time to listen and talk. And maybe like 
that doesn't sometimes come naturally. You can't just like change that. So working with, because this is something you put in the notes, working with like a therapist, psychologist, an SSE on like tools to help starting to notice these things and how to communicate them and how to tend to them too. That's a big part of it. Well, reacting versus responding. Yeah. That's a big one. Yeah. Right. A lot of times we react because our emotions get so caught up and we end up just reacting and we blurt out something that's probably pretty stupid. <laughs> like really it, sometimes. And it's just, Oh, that was dumb. I shouldn't have said that. Right. Instead of like responding by taking the time to understand how that feels, how it feels inside your body, process it, process it, and then find a way to respond that's compassionate as well as honest with how you feel. Yeah. And it's interesting because there are so many male influences out there now who come across as being kind of woke and kind of, but then they do say things like women don't want men to ask them, you know, if they want to be kissed, they just want to be taken, like be a man, like be dominant, you know, all this consent nonsense, women don't actually want that. But what you're saying is that that has improved your relationship greatly, that has brought you closer, that Tara does have the ability to then gatekeep her body, but also tell you where and how you can bring her more pleasure to to her body. And that's an interesting one when you have men out there saying that women don't actually like to be asked. It's It feels like more of the same, right? The patriarchy just wrapping itself up in, oh no, we're being super feminist. We're giving women what they want. <laughs> the, women want an alpha male. Exactly. And but that could be the case for some numerous relationships. Right. But that also has to be discussed beforehand. Yeah. So you have to take the time to understand that that's what your partner wants. Yeah. Like, I want you to be dominant in my relationship, daddy. And then setting that up. As yeah. a thing. But you have to take the time to develop those things to get to that point. You can't just walk into a relationship, grab a girl by the back of the neck and start making out with her. And then she slaps you in the face, throws a drink at you and walks away. That's not how this works. A lot of times there, that dynamic and even in like DS relationships, you know, master sub relationships, that is a full questionnaire to get to that point that that's what you're looking for. And that's what you want. Because you don't want to re-traumatize -tra somebody as well. And if you're constantly doing that to somebody who they're getting triggered a little bit more every single time, like eventually that relationship is something's going to give. I've never really been that dominant person really ever though. So it's never been for me like, oh, I'm just going to grab you and take you. And I think that for me, huge eye opener was when we started when... I think we talked with probably Marcus from I think it was Marcus Leather Masters. Yeah. Yeah. He would break down how he would get to the point of having that without having to constantly ask. Mm -hmm. That took so much time, mm -hmm. effort, energy, and understanding, active listening, really, really listening to your partner of what they want, what they don't want, and for yourself though too, right? Where do you feel most comfortable? How does this make you feel comfortable? Does being a dom person make you feel comfortable? Do you feel good about this stuff? A lot of times, sometimes it doesn't because it, for me, it makes me feel, I guess a kind of comparison to my parents and their relationship and, and this doesn't wasn't necessarily the best relationship there was some abuse that happened and that sort of dominating sort of this mochismo sort of attitude that my dad had at some points kind of was like no i don't want to go down that path you didn't want to replicate it no and that's why we've never really been in that type of kink play is because it's hard for you to get there right and but that only we would never have discovered that if we didn't have that conversation and that's why also non-monogamy 
can be a really healthy aspect to our relationship because I can still get fulfillment from that. James doesn't have to put him in a position of where his body's saying no, but he's enduring. And, you know, we kind of are both happy at the end. Hey, I'm okay if somebody wants to slap the shit out of her ass and make her bruise so she can't sit down for a week. I'm totally okay with that. Hey, spanking for me, that's that's different. But like some sometimes there's contact to like the face and bruising and that sort of aspect. And for me, that's I'm just I'm not a big pain person and I'm not a big deliverer of pain. I like pleasure more than anything. So that's just yeah. pleasure heals. <laughs> exactly. And so would you say that those are some of the shifts that you've noticed when you started deconstructing your patriarchy, your inner patriarchy, was that you found different ways that your desires and fantasies could both be met in ways that felt comfortable to both of you? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I was a very sexual person and like we would have lots and lots of sex and yet something for her specifically tara there was something missing there because i was so sexual and if you look at my erotic blueprint i'm like like over 50 percent sexual and then everything else is kind of sprinkled around the exact same and kinky is my last and yet when she did the test it was like it was like shape shapeshifter and then it was like Pink. all the exact same energetic right and then they were all and then sexual was her last and that comparison was a great understanding for me to realize that and it was a big eye opener for me specifically that it was like oh so i've been doing this and filling that cup and i think of them all as cups and so i've been filling her sexual cup which is her least like the smallest cup so i've literally (laughs) had that shit overflowing everywhere and mine's like you know it's gradually filling and filling and filling and then i realize i'm like holy cow that's why alternative relationships create a dynamic where that might not be your stick. That might not be your thing. That might not make, get you going. That doesn't get that mojo flowing. But somebody else could do that. Somebody that, you know, we've had that conversation with. We've broken down some dialogue. We've had, you know, maybe not. Sometimes it doesn't, you don't get to have all the conversations you want to have. But sometimes you do get to. And you develop that and it grows and grows. And now you have these great friendships as well as a, you know, sexual chemistry. And, and it kind of becomes this whole fun, love sharing sort of environment that just communal feels, the commune. No, feels good. Thanks, oh, village. Things escalated quickly. <laughs> uh... Yeah. I don't, how do you feel about moving into maybe some IG questions? We should probably take a break though. Do you want to? Okay. Because we got to pay the bills. Got to turn the lights on. You know what I mean? Well, it's just music. <laughs> <laughs> do 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 Break time. We'll be back after the break. <laughs> Did you enjoy that music? Hopefully you did. We are back now after the break (laughs) with some Instagram questions, some questions and answers from James. Tara, what questions did you get? We got two. James, how are you okay with your significant other not fitting the traditional mold of what they should be? Like monogamous and straight, et cetera. I'm out. I bail. That's it. (laughs) I'm done. That's no, right. yeah, cut it off. It's all over. <laughs> See, and that's but majority of the people that would fit inside that box would probably say. I, on the other hand, am 100% okay with absolutely everything as long as I have a connection and I love the person that is inside this beautiful body right next to me here. We're slowly getting closer. Yeah, sorry. slowly, slowly bringing it back. <laughs> Started moving at, about moving out of punching distance. <laughs> but I'm I'm okay with pretty much everything as long as it's one, consensual, and two, based around mutual respect. I yeah. think that, that those two kind of come into play when you are 
let's say you're going outside of your relationship or you're extending it to not being non-monogamous or even just being a voyeur and showing up at sex clubs, watching people have sex. That is a very, that's a, that's erotic. That's hot. And it, again, gets you to start learning about what you like, what you don't like and that sort of thing. But I'm very okay with my significant other. And that was the question I used to get a lot. It's like, how are you okay with your significant other doing this? And how can you let her do these things? It's like, I can't let her do anything. Majority of the decisions that were made by her and by me were ma- based on mutual respect and consent. And I feel like things are shifting. Like we just watched this stupid reality show called Perfect Perfect Match. And so on, I don't know if you've seen it, Sylvie, but on it, there's, there's two women and they're bisexual. And one of them is also wanting an open relationship, like with her long-term partner. And like, if you were to watch a reality show 10 years ago, there is no way that that would be on reality TV. And it was really interesting to see the dynamics of them with their match and like how different men that they were with responded to this, how other people perceived them because of it. But I feel like it is like shifting. Like it was pretty, it was cool. And now I follow these two, two gals on Instagram. I'm like, Hmm. And one of them's like, have you never been in a threesome? Oh my God, they're the best. And people were just like, how could you? But like, she owned it. And I was like, applauding her i'm like yeah you go girl <laughs> nice job. i'm sorry but she was also a psycho bitch she, she <laughs> sorry was. i and i and i use that i don't ever really she, use that term she was, but she me. was she was she malicious was she was vindictive she was manipulative she tried to win a game and ended up walking out of the house without a partner she didn't have a Aww. partner match so let's but- just say but yes. she was she, pretty honest about she who she was. And honest, yes. And I was like, oh, well. you can be both bisexual and totally unhinged. <laughs> I, I knew this from personal experience. Well, well said, Sylvie. <laughs> well said. <laughs> Just being queer does not mean that you have done the work, you know? Like, I know that we're supposed to be all woke and stuff, but no, we... Uh, it's true. We, we can be crazy just like anyone else. Yeah. No, it is true. Days, we're just like you. (laughs) Okay, question number two, you ready? Yes. What is the first step to breaking my patriarchal mindset? You you put some notes in here because I kind of gave you a heads up of what some of these questions were. Creating a really healthy support system. And that includes friends, family, if it's necessary, your significant other, SSCs, therapists, community, you said community. I well, and I, that's the one thing that I loved about the lifestyle from, from my perspective was the people. Now that kind of got to, and we also <laughs> talked about surrogate partnership. Yeah. For people who surrogate don't know therapy. what surrogate, surrogate partner is. Yeah. So a surrogate partner is uh, often a full service sex worker who uh also practices being in relationship mm-hmm. with you so you get to practice all aspects of what it's like to be in relationship with a person and then you get to work on things that come up both with your surrogate partner and with a therapist because surrogate partners work with a therapist and with a client and it's sort of a, a triangle uh shaped experience there And uh, again, people really like surrogate partnerships because it gives them a sandbox for having a relationship with a person while also being observed and given feedback and Mm -hmm. being able to work on things in real time. And it's full cycle. You get to go through a breakup too. Yeah. And how that feels and learning how to overcome it and move to the next step and mm-hmm. you know navigate a new path that's just so it's you, so cool to when we were talking about it i was like that is an amazing tool to have as for somebody and and it doesn't necessarily just have to be for men it can be for women too but yeah. breaking out of that patriarchal mindset takes a lot because it's 
been programmed and we talk about that. We used to talk about that all the time when it came to traditional relationships that has been shoved down your throat and programmed into you over and over and over again that it's since birth. Yeah. Right. It's men, women, it's, this is how the traditional relationship is. You know, you go to high school, then you go to college, then you get married, you have kids, you get a job. It's just like, it's like almost like your whole life ends up getting laid out for you and breaking away from those traditional norms. Again, you got to step outside the box, step out of step. Sometimes you might have to step out of your comfort zone to whether you know where your comfort zone lies. Cause you don't know if you don't know, <laughs> really, you don't know what you like if you don't ever try it. So if you don't ever step outside the box, if you don't ever step into a different phase into your life into your relationship or into anything else how would you know yeah and i do think i mean hopefully a new generation of kids is being raised with slightly less uh patriarchal values and slightly more options i i know my son yesterday when i asked him to get in the shower he, uh, post for you. <laughs> he said thanks mom not right now Thanks for asking, though. You go ahead and enjoy the shower or something like that. And it was like, dude, you need a freaking shower. You stink. But it was like, no, thanks for asking, but not right now. And it was like, his, you know, he's really exercising that consent muscle. And also, I think we were talking about, I have a, a, a stomach growl that happens very often. And I refer to my stomach growl as a gremlin. And uh, my son was asking about the gremlin. And he was like, so is gremlin like a guy or a girl or non-binary like what are they and I was like that's interesting that you would ask that and I was like does it matter it's a gremlin and he was like how does it identify as like grim and I was like yeah it identifies as grim <laughs> and I was like that's such an Aww. interesting like he cares about how people identify and I don't know if I've been particularly strict about it but he's clearly getting that so the world is changing yeah and I think it's kind of awesome that there are yeah. options now for young men growing up that they don't have to be the same. Mm -hmm. but they yeah, can be I would more agree. Gentle. There's a whole new world. It's starting because us millennials were like so traumatized. <laughs> and we're like, okay, we're going to do the work. We have to go to therapy. We have to take care of ourselves and our mental health. And then we started having babies and we were like, we want to break these generational traumas that we've all endured. And I think that's, it's really starting, but I mean, like, yeah, we, it, it's work and not everybody yeah. is capable of doing it. And some people don't choose not and to, some people don't want to, but you know, just taking care of ourselves yeah, is where it starts. So do you Dames. and whatever health reason whatever health reasons you want to do it for it's just you got it you can do it <laughs> try it but out even you just try pegging guys it's fine <laughs> it's fine trust me you'll it's like a tag it. tagline for this podcast try pegging guys it's fine uh, speaking well, of plugs james how do people find you what if they would like to find you and your magic fingers and your anti-patriarchal wisdom where can they find you uh just reach out to tara she'll let me know <laughs> um, <laughs> i think i have an instagram i think it's called seven james one 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 i think that's I'm, i don't think he's I ever have, posted anything hey i got a few things up there i got some nachos of the place we like to go to in town other than that I, uh, you can obviously reach out to the sex ed for the modern bed show. I'm on most of the social medias as well. I think we share the Twitter. I have access to the sex ed for the modern bed show Instagram. So do you No, <laughs> Well, maybe not the sex ed for the, but the sex ed show. I don't know. Maybe. Consent. I don't Consent. know. We're like, it was all it's all been interconnected and it's all an extension of sex uninterrupted so you can also go to sexuninterrupted.com there's no, we haven't really done anything with that website in a very long time you can check out our podcast it's on soundcloud itunes anywhere you want to look at your podcast i'm pretty sure it's up there i used to always say if you can't find us on one of your podcast sites you're not looking in the right place 
Um, but uh, yeah, so if you want to hear all old stuff. Now, a lot of that stuff, I will warn you, it was before I ever really did any of this sort of work with Tara and stuff like that. So some of the things that we may have said or talked about might not align with how we feel now. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they may align with you and that would be great. But right now, ours, our perception and perspective has changed a bit. So yeah, that's where you can find me. Thank awesome. you. That, James. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to you, James. And thank you to to you, Tara, for for sharing, you know, your partner and aspects of your personal life with us today. Mm, yeah, I'm excited to bring James on here. I'm happy that we got uh, a cis man on here and got to, because I'm like, hey, we're hitting episode 10. So <laughs> we, we, we are big creatures of diversity and this is part of being diverse on our show. Yeah, cis men, dead people too. <laughs> and a big shout out to the listeners. You guys are amazing. Thank you for keeping the lights on. Yes, thank you for tuning into Sex Ed for the Modern Bed. If you're looking for more ways to connect and access with us, you can get social and follow us. You can follow the show's Instagram at the.sexed.show or our individual Instagrams at Sex Ed for the Modern Bed and Sex and Sensibility with the E in sex being a three. So until next time, claim your pleasure, own your body, and stay in presence. Woo!